I'm going to start um, now because it's just respecting people's time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I think this is our fourth webinar um, that we have done uh, over since we started deciding about doing webinars. And so the format of today, we're talking about working in the UK. Um, and the topic that I'm going to talk about today um, is because we get a lot of inquiries about how people can work in the UK. If you haven't got a family life here, then you're going to be interested in working in the UK if you want to live here. So um, that's going to be what we're talking about today. So we're not going to go off that topic too much. And we are going to try and stay on there. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel O'Kello, and I qualified as a solicitor in November 2002. And I am um, a UK based solicitor. I've been in the jewelry court in the same building since 2007. Uh, that's the building that I've been in. And people say, Rachel, are you still there? Yes, I'm still in my building. You can still find me there for the last, how many years now? 40, well, 20, 2007 to 2024, so a long time. Um, I've got extensive experience in immigration law and we provide a professional and reliable service known for giving people full and frank advice about their immigration issues. I particularly specialise in immigration for people who've lived in the UK for a long time, um, for families seeking assistance with their visa applications and with other immigration matters, including work visas. And I'm joined today, and it's a real big pleasure to be joined today by our special guest, Barrister MJ Jibuwu, who is already on the call. And he is a practicing um, barrister with decades of experience. He's the person that got me into um, immigration. Certainly when I was just starting out with immigration law, we did a huge case together that we won, um, which involved a Sunday night um, at one o'clock in the morning, we actually got a injunction against somebody who was being deported at five o'clock. So four hours, we had four hours to the flight. And we, I'll always remember, we worked on that case and we got an injunction and stopped the person being deported. And that person is, is in the UK working and um, recently contacted me to get his British citizenship. So we've done very, and powerful work together. MJ is the co-author of Practical Solutions and Nationality Matters, which he um, authored with MJ Solomon and Partners. So MJ is a barrister and we work very, very closely together indeed. And he is going to be on the call and um, joining me for this conversation. Just a little bit of housekeeping then. As usual, nobody can see you on the call. Um, they'll see your name when it comes up. But when we rec we're recording this, and when we record it, we just do it as an audio, so nobody sees who's who's here. Um, so there are people in the chat. So it it's a bit weird with these webinars. You can never know who's here, um, but there are other people here with you. Um, so we've disabled the chat, so there's not a separate conversation happening. Um, but we have got the Q and A button open, so you can answer questions. But the format of this is going to be a webinar, and therefore we may have answered the questions um, along the way that you may not need to ask at the end. So if you do have um, a question, you can raise your hand when we get to the Q&A section, and then when we ask you to unmute, you can unmute. And I have my wonderful um, assistant on Lucani, who is um, going to help with the um, admin in the background. So please ask broad questions. This is not meant to be a consultation. It's not meant to be us giving you advice that you can go off and necessarily rely on. We're just trying to give you a taste of what immigration involves in the world of skilled worker visas. So we won't be asking, answering specific questions, but we'll be answering questions which we think everybody, in a way that we feel everybody can benefit from um, the answer, because at the end of the day, it's mostly the same cases that people are going through, just with different scenarios, if you like. Um, so we try to give a broad um, broad answer. So we do casework and consultancy. We provide advice and representation. Um, we are having some online courses. We do have an ebook, which is on our website already. The website is clarityvisas.com. And if you haven't done so, do subscribe to our newsletter at clarityvisas.com because I do put very important information in those newsletters. I'm not one of those people that just email you randomly just to email you. No, it's because we've got something very important to tell you and therefore um, do um, uh, subscribe at clarityvisas.com to our newsletter. We offer a free discussion. I call it a discussion. It used to be a whole consultation and I'd get on the phone and talk for so long and it'd be free. 
But with the home office delays and all that sort of thing, I don't have the capacity to do that anymore. So it's just a discussion to give you your options um, for you to um, know the options in your immigration case. And then we do offer a more detailed um, video call, which is £75 plus VAT, which is £90. And then I can take time, go over your case papers and have to, a 45 minute video call with you to go through your options and give you some advice and guidance. OK, so we're going to talk through um, the work visas um, today, and I'm just going to go through the different types of work visas first. And before I ask MJ to come on and just give us a breakdown of skilled worker visas and um, health and care worker visas, I just want to sh um, show you that normally when people contact me, I ask them, do they have a job offer in the UK? Because they'll contact me that they want to come to the UK um, to work. And so I normally say, do you have a job offer? But there are times when you can actually um, work in the UK without needing a job offer. And I just listed some of the jobs here that you um, don't need a job offer for if you want to work in the UK. Very popular one at the moment is the graduate visa. Um, the government recently said they were not going to make any changes to the graduate visa, um, which is good because it's a very flexible visa and it allows you to, to work after studying and to get um, uh, some experience after you study. One thing I have noticed with graduate visas is people have, are running out of time. So they kind of get onto the graduate visa, um, they don't do anything for the two years, and then towards the end, they start to um, panic and see what they can do next because a graduate visa is going to expire. So if you are on a graduate visa route or you're planning to go on a graduate visa route, do think ahead before you even get on that route as to what you're going to do after. It's a buffer. It's not meant to be um, a sort of long residence um, application. It's just a buffer. And then um, these are roles that you can do if you're still keeping your, UK, your overseas job, but you're gonna work in the UK. And there's a lot of global mobility work. Um, where you can be working for your overseas employer, employer, but in the UK. And we've got the UK expansion worker visa there, representative of an overseas business visa. Um, and there's ones about specifically for Switzerland as well. Um, and those are jobs that you can do in the UK for your overseas employer. Now these change all the time. So you do need to check, this is the latest information, but you do need to check all the time if the home office, because that's one of the areas that they very much mess around with is um, work visas. So you do need to check with the home office application form um, that you're applying for the correct visa. Then we have the temporary work visa, um, which is seasonal workers. There's lots of roles that you can do there. Um, you can follow me on my social media, Rachel O'Kello or Clarity Visas. I do talk a lot about the different types of visas that people can get to come to the UK. There's the religious worker visa as well, the charity worker visa. So there are lots of different types of work visas that you can um, apply for in order to come to the UK. If you're outside of the UK, you can enter and some roles you'll be able to switch into if you're already in the UK. And then the final type of other visas I want to look at is the Business Innovator Founder Visa. That's if you wanna to come to the UK to do business. There's a sports person visa, which you've always had. Um, Relig Minister of Religion visa is another very good visa. If you want to come to the UK for religious reasons, then you can um, become, a, you know, if you're a minister of religion, then you can apply for a minister of religion visa and you'll need to get um, the relevant employment, qualifying employment in the UK to get that visa. And then we've also got the scale at worker visa as well, which is another very good visa um, for people who've got an entrepreneurial mindset to come and work in the UK. So what we're gonna focus on today really is the visas that people contact us most about. And that is the skilled worker visa and the healthcare worker visa. And so I'm going to just take you through um, the criteria for the skilled worker visa. And I'm just gonna invite some commentary from MJ um, about the skilled worker visa, anything else he wants us to know and where he thinks that this is um, going at the moment. So as you can see, you need to be um, have the specific employer and employment and specific job for this type of visa. You need to be on a particular salary level. And there's also a minimum income, um, minimum wage that you need to be on and a, a certain number of hours that you can work in order to be, to be successful on this application. So I'm gonna ask MJ to just unmute 
and take us through the work, skilled worker visa, please. Thank you very much, Rachel. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can, yeah. Yes, um, thank you. That um, was a very good introduction. Uh, uh, really, the skilled workers visa, as um, Rachel has said, um, is set out so that people with skills uh, can come to or remain in the UK and uh, offer uh, their services to specific employers. Now, uh, the background to that is that uh, before we had skilled workers visas, uh, we used to have work permit um, schemes uh, where the Home Office had a two-tier system. The Home Office would uh, Department of Employment would issue a work permit, and then one would take that work permit to the Home Office and um, to obtain um, leave to remain. Now that changed a uh, few years back, and we've got um, the point-based system tied up with a skilled workers visa. And what that means now is that the, the uh, prospective employer would apply to the UK VI for what is called a sponsor's license. Um, there is no point in going to an employer that does not have a license. There will be no use, there will be no good to you. Where an employer has been able to secure a license, the license means they can then in turn issue what we call certificate of sponsorship. That in essence is the work permit the employer is giving to you that I'm sponsoring you uh, to work in the UK. Uh, I have the necessary capacity uh, to take you on and uh, the job I'm giving to you um, is the one that is recognized uh, by the Home Office. So the employer would have done all of that uh, before they get their sponsor's license. Um, and what the employee then needs to do with the certificate of sponsorship is to then make an application uh, to the Home Office or to the Entry Clearance Office, if one is still outside the country, uh, to uh, come and work in the UK. Uh, using that um, sponsorship certificate. Uh, along with the sponsorship certificate would be a letter, an offer of employment, mirroring um, the job uh, specification, uh, the salary level, uh, which must be consistent with what the Home Office has set, um, the duration of the sponsorship, and um, whether or not uh, the employer would uh, undertake maintenance of the applicant and their dependents, at least for the first month of engagement, uh, so that the employee does not have to prove that they have the funds to maintain themselves in their early arrival in the UK. But in essence, that's the format uh, for the uh, sponsorship license and um, um, certificate of sponsorship. Uh, upon uh, submitting an application uh, for the visa or leave to remain, the Home Office would consider the application uh, to make sure that it, it is a genuine employment, um, that the salary levels are consistent uh, with uh, the occupational code level set uh, by the Home Office, and um, that um, the employer has the capacity so it's not an automatic thing that uh, once you get the certificate of sponsorship, uh, you would get um, the, the visa for the job. The Home Office would still do its own uh, inquiries. Um, more often than not, uh, because the employers having the sponsorship license are in a sense uh, representing the Home Office as the agent of the Home Office to say, look, we've looked at the standard you've set out and that's the basis upon which we have issued the certificate of sponsorship. Unless there was something really, really wrong, uh, the Home Office has some information, uh, you know, negative information about the employers. Uh, uh, well, I've Rachel and I have never known of a situation where we have a certificate of sponsorship 
and one has made an application and it's been refused, uh, that it does not comply with home office requirements. Uh, as long as the employer um, is credible, uh, there are no investigations going on about the employer or uh, the, certificate, uh, the sponsorship license has not been suspended. Usually, well, like I said, 100% of the time, uh, we've always had um, the prospective employees uh, receive the grant of leave to remain or uh, the grant of uh, 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 entry clearance uh, to come and work in the UK. Now, um, the employee uh, gets the leave. Um, if the employee was already in the UK in another visa category, um, not all employees can switch uh, to the skilled workers category. Uh, uh, not all uh, migrants, I beg your pardon, can switch to the skilled workers category. Uh, Short-term students, visitors, uh, those on domestic workers visa, and um, people who leave are usually less than six months uh, would not be able to switch uh, to the skilled workers category. Students who have graduated and who have completion certificates um, workers uh, from different uh, sectors can switch from one category to the other. Uh, usually, they will be able to do that as long as they meet the requirements of the particular skill um, sector uh, they're seeking to work in, uh, the current application. Uh, so that basically is um, the little background about um, skilled work. Um, um, and um, certificate of sponsorship. Um, uh, well, you may be thinking, uh, I haven't said all of that, what are their cost implications? Yes, there are cost implications uh, to the employee. And the cost implications would be that uh, the fee for the visa or entry clearance application would usually be borne uh, by the employee, uh, the migrant employee who wants to come to the UK, or who wants to remain in the UK. But uh, those uh, application costs are not usually uh, prohibitive. They're usually reasonable costs. Uh, we're talking between uh, just 234 pounds uh, to about 551 pounds, depending on how long uh, your certificate of sponsorship uh, has been granted for. For those who, whose uh, sponsorship uh, certificate have been granted for three years or less, they're paying about 231, 234 pounds. Whereas um, those whose uh, um, certificate of sponsorship in brackets, their work permits are for longer duration with up to five years would be paying the higher sum of about 551 pounds. Uh, so that's the cost implication in that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that very good um, background. You'll see that I've put on the um, screen the, the eligibility requirements, but it's very good for Mr. Jabu there to have given a background and put it into the context of the real world so that people can understand um, when they need to make a skilled worker visa and the likelihood of success for the skilled worker visa as well. And so you would have had the chance to look through the criteria there um, to see um, if you're eligible for that. So thank you for that. Um, and then we've got the health and care worker visa. And MJ, I just wonder if you could just take us through the background of the health and care worker visa in the, in the way that it's different to just saying a skilled worker visa. Right. Well, the health care uh, visa, um, uh, yes, is under the skilled uh, uh, worker visa. Um, category, but it's been, you know, given a special designation uh, by the Secretary of State. And that was in recognition of the fact that um, around about the COVID time, it became obvious that um, there was a big shortage of healthcare workers. Uh, and that uh, was uh, part of what culminated into uh, the government uh, granting concessions uh, with the healthcare uh, visa. Now, uh, the concessions have been kind of a bit narrowed down and watered down uh, because uh, the healthcare uh, visa used to be under what we call shortage occupation, as uh, the name depicts. 
uh, screaming that, look, this occupation, we, we, we are short in this area. We need people. We are desperate for people to come and work in this sector, hence shortage occupation. And uh, with that, there were some benefits, uh, which included the fact that uh, the workers in that sector uh, would normally pay less in terms of um, uh, what's the pay to the home office for the applications. Uh, they would also, um, in addition to that, uh, not be required uh, to pay what is called the immigration health surcharge, uh, which is um, a, 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 a levy the government uh, imposes on uh, skilled workers. So what you're working, going to be working here for two and a half years, then you'd have to pay um, the skill, uh, uh, the health surcharge for that period of time. If it's for five years, you pay the the, the health care uh, charge for that period. Um, but with those under the um, uh, health care workers category, they don't have to pay the health charge. And the, 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 that's really, really a big plus because uh, the, the health health charge has gone up significantly. It's uh, about £1,035 for a duration of one year. So if one, can you imagine multiplying that by five years? It's a lot of money. So that um, at least uh, is a benefit to those working in this sector. And their applications are also usually um, considered and determined uh, swiftly as opposed to uh, taking three, four, five, up to eight weeks. Some categories like um, the expansion worker scheme could take as long as eight weeks. Uh, we've had situations where we've done applications for healthcare workers and they get their visas within or leave to remain within the same week. So uh, that's pretty much uh, is uh, another benefit. But it's no longer called a shortage occupation now. They, we have a list uh, called the Immigration Skilled Workers Salary List. And fortunately enough, uh, care workers and senior care workers have been retained on that list. And the benefit of that list is that uh, there is uh, an average of approximately 20% uh, reduction uh, in the salary expectations uh, so that employers are not under pressure. Uh, it's easier. And it's it more. It makes it more flexible for employers to take on workers in that um, area of work. If the salary level remained very high, uh, employers will be struggling uh, to take on or retain uh, workers in that category. But uh, uh, the benefit still extends to um, the healthcare workers, so they also get about twenty percent uh, of what would normally be. Uh, the threshold for salaries. So that's an encouragement for employers to at least take on skilled workers. But generally, uh, all the um, skilled workers' uh, salary thresholds have been raised uh, by the government uh, uh, with a, a bid or with a view to uh, kind of uh, discourage uh, workers coming in to undercut uh, local workers. Um, uh, uh, citizens and settled uh, people, uh, you know, who uh, perhaps will be finding it difficult to secure employment uh, at the rate they would normally want to be paid, uh, where those coming in as skilled workers, and in this case, healthcare workers are being paid significantly less. Uh, but the fact is that um, there's still a shortage, you know, big, huge shortage uh, in that industry uh, so that em employers still need workers to come in uh, 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 to carry out the healthcare work. And thank you. Uh, yes, can I pause there for you? Yes, thank you. And the, the, um, the requirement that you need to fulfill to have the health and care visa to do the application is on the screen. And as Mr. Jabu says, um, there's still a shortage. I mean, a lot of people do contact me and ask us, can we find jobs? Solicitors don't find jobs. You need to look for a job. But there are still, a, it's a big shortage of health and care 
workers in the UK, there's doctor shortage, nurse shortage, healthcare providers, um, and social workers as well. There's a big shortage. So if you're particularly interested in those roles, it would be about doing the training first and then being in a position to apply for that. Um, I just want to go over again what um, Mr. Jabu said about um, the certificate of sponsorship. Um, and that's where he started, because as I've said, the starting point really is to look for a qualifying role with an employer who has a sponsorship license. So that's why we started that before you even talk about work visas, um, the employer will have to have the sponsorship license. Um, and that would have the details of the job offer. It explains how you qualify for the visa and it will give this, the code that you're going to use to show that the job that you are um, applying for either um, comes within the criteria for a work visa application to become successful. And that's really important because a lot of the time people don't realize that in order to come to the UK on a work visa, you do need to have a certificate of sponsorship. And it really starts with that. Um, um, MJ, you may want to talk about the ban on partners and children um, that's happening at the moment. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I say unfortunately because it's caused a lot of distress. Um, earlier on in the year, uh, was it 4th of, 4th of April or 11th of March? Uh, I know we, we've been talking. 11th of March, I think. It was 11th of March, March yes. Right. Uh, was the court of Mac. So that if one was coming in as uh, a healthcare worker, uh, one would no longer be able to bring in their uh, dependents as their spouse, say, and their children. Prior to that time, uh, all healthcare workers could bring in um, their dependents, but care workers and um, assistant care workers, senior care workers no longer able to do that. Uh, however, those who had already been in the country uh, prior to that date or who had been granted um, their entry clearance or leave to remain prior to that date are still able uh, to sponsor, as it were, their uh, dependents, as their spouses and their children. And how do they sponsor them? Well, uh, since I'm here as a healthcare worker, I could ask my wife and my children uh, to make applications wherever they are so that they can come and join me in the UK. Uh, all they need to do is to pay the fees uh, where necessary, take the uh, tuberculosis tests. Uh, they don't have to satisfy uh, the English language requirement. Of course, uh, uh, oddly, the spouses are usually asked uh, to do the criminal tests so that they must obtain a criminal test certificate. Uh, initially, when the scheme was rolled out, uh, we imagined that um, being a sensitive industry, it's only the care workers uh, that would require the criminal uh, uh, check certificates. Uh, to say they do not have any criminal conviction, convictions and they are fit and proper to be able to work in that industry. But strangely enough, the Home Office would insist uh, that their spouses must also have the certificate. I don't know the rationale behind that, but that's the way it is. Uh, but like I said, for those who have been here before uh, 11th of March, uh, they're still able to bring in their spouses and their dependents. Um, to the UK. Brilliant, because that's been a source of confusion and real concern for people, um, be thinking that they wouldn't be able to, that their children and spouse wouldn't be able to stay here. So if they were already here before that um, move from the government, then they can certainly stay um, in the UK and continue. Yes, may, may I add that yeah. if they were already here before uh, that date, uh, but in another category and not healthcare, and they have only switched to healthcare after that date, then they are caught out by that new law, that prohibition on being able to bring in spouses and dependents. 
Yes, so it's uh, they're on the they're already on that route. That's very important yes. to know that they must have been on that route already. It's really um tricky and very distressing, I think, for people. Um, I just wanted to give a word about dependence um, because we sometimes see that people apply for their dependence, particularly children, to come to the UK as their dependents on a work visa, and then they're surprised that um, the work that the application is refused. So, for example, um, there'll be the wife and she applies for to come to the UK. She's got a work visa. Child is in the country living with the father, for example, and then they apply to come to the UK. They apply to mother will apply to bring the child only to the UK. MJ, um, people are surprised that the Home Office refused those applications. What's that all about? Can you tell us? Yes, uh, it's it's part and parcel of um, general immigration um, um, rules. Uh, where people with semi or quasi semi status would want to bring in uh, their dependents, family members. And uh, we've always had a, 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 a rule called the, the sole responsibility rule, uh, which says uh, family members coming, children coming in to join such a person in the UK uh, would have to be joining both parents or be coming in with the other parent uh, so that there will be two parents in the UK. Unless, of course, uh, the other parent of such a, a child, dependent child, had passed away. Or uh, if there were very, very compelling reasons why that um, rule that requires both parents to be with the child uh, where, where, where that rule uh, would have to be uh, uh, suspended on their behalf. Uh, what sole responsibility means is that uh, the such a child, dependent child, would only be allowed to join a single parent if the parent can prove that he or she has had sole responsibility for the care of the child while the child uh, was abroad. And uh, it's not a very easy uh, uh, rule to navigate, uh, but it's one that is not insurmountable, uh, but it's one where uh, applicants would 100% of the time need the guidance of um, a lawyer or a counselor uh, because it's quite you know, difficult for a lay person to uh, prove to the home office that a child living in the same community uh, with the other parent um, does not enjoy any benefits from that parent in terms of care or attention or financial benefit. So those are the kind of things the they, they, uh, parent in the UK would have to deal with. So it's usually important to ask um, for advice, seek advice, legal advice in that area. Uh, uh, most of those who come to us to say, hello, I'm sorry, we've been refused, is usually too late because they volunteered information that ties them in to say, oh, yes, uh, it's shared responsibility. As far as this child is concerned, the parent in the UK does not have sole responsibility. Uh, and when that happens, uh, th then we fall follow the rule. That means the child cannot come. The rule uh, would not allow someone to come if there was another parent abroad that can look after them, unless that parent was coming with them. And that's the, 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 the meaning of sole responsibility. And it's it's a nightmare, it's a, it's a migrant's nightmare, uh, but yes. lawyers can navigate it, provided they are consulted on time, uh, they are instructed on it on time, uh, so that the necessary uh, documents and proof of the mother's sole responsibility can be collated and presented with the application. Yes, because it normally is the case that the parent does have sole responsibility, but um, once you mention the other parent at all, the Home Office then tries to say, aha, you know, there's somebody else. So you have to, of course, the application has to be completely truthful and accurate and complete with all the information. Absolutely. But it's just a matter of making it clear to the Home Office whilst doing that that you do have sole responsibility for the child. Yes. 
And then I wanted to just look at sham work visas. I don't think that we can um, talk about work visas without talking about sham work schemes, because uh, that's a lot of the inquiries that I get all the time, because obviously I do a lot of family work and long residence work, helping people to regularize their immigration status, mm -hmm. as, do, as do you, MJ. And, um, you know, a lot of the time there's, there's sham work schemes um, that people get caught up in. Oh, it's, mm, it's, a big, yes. it's a big pandemic now. Mm. Um, and it's a shame um, that uh, a lot of people get caught in that. Uh, we're desperately looking for employers. You want to come to the UK and they get uh, all kind of agents who would uh, promise them employment in the UK uh, for significant sums of money. Um, a lot of people have lost their life savings <laughs> because they're desperate, they're eager to come to the UK um, for greener pastures, rightly so, uh, but uh, go through middlemen and agents who would uh, say to them, yes, we'll secure employment for you. Uh, we've got a list of employers uh, who we work with, so if you pay us this sum, and um, some uh, go past um, uh, just uh, paying off the money they, they get, uh, the certificate of sponsorship, and arrive in the UK, but there's no job waiting for them. And um, some, a uh, significant number of such employers that are in business with such agents uh, have their licenses revoked. And when that happens, the migrant worker I would also have their visas are curtailed. They're only given 60 days uh, to try uh, and decide what they want to do. They're able to switch to another category and find another employer, fine. If not, in 60 days, you must be out of the country. If you're not out of the country in 60 days, then you become an overstayer in breach of um, your immigration condition. And uh, that means you begin to have a negative immigration history. Can you imagine someone coming all the way from Jamaica, Nigeria, Kenya, uh, used all their life savings uh, to arrive here, hoping to secure employment? Well, they think they have secured employment because they have a certificate of sponsorship and a letter from an employer saying, yes, you can come and work with us. And they arrive in the UK, but the employer says, we don't have any work. Um, mm -hmm. They become homeless. Uh, they have to depend on food banks to eat. It's really, really distressing. So one must, the, the, the uh, migrants must be very, very, very careful. They must be quite discerning. And um, imagine that if an employer was going to charge you thousands and thousands of pounds in order to take you on uh, to work for them, you begin to ask yourself if this was a genuine employer in the first place. Um, Yes, yeah, because you you basically your work the money you're going to work for you've already paid the employer one way or another anyway. And you know? yes, and such employer is not willing to give you that money back. Yes, that's what I mean. They won't give it back to you at all. Yes. So you pay them. What I would say to people is, um, it falls back to when you make an application before your current leave to remain expires, then you remain in the UK lawfully on the same basis. So as Mr. Jabu says there, you, you know, I do start by saying to people, because most of the time people haven't been here for that long when they come on a work visa and then they find out there's no work, mm -hmm. is why can't you go back home? You know, that's the first thing I say to people, go back home because, you know, obviously we want to stay in the UK, but not at all costs at any cost, because you can have end up having a life of destitution. So you would need to think about going back home. But if you don't go back home, if you can't go back home for whatever reason, it could be family life reasons, private life reasons, you know, protection reasons, then you need to make an application before your current leave to remain expires. So before the curtailment period ends, or if you're already aware of your own situation, before your leave to remain expires, you need to make an application to tell the Home Office why you're still in the UK beyond the expiry date of your visa. And I think that's very important. And I think it doesn't matter what the reason is that you're going to be here, you need to make an application and tell the Home Office the reason. And you must also remember that they do say, don't make an application on something that doesn't relate to you or apply to you. You know, just don't make up a story. Um, it's gotta be an application that applies to you, but you have to make sure that you don't let your leave to remain expire before um, you put in another application or you should leave the country 
which is a good thing to do, really, because if you get another job, then you can come back, probably um, apply to come back and have less problems um, to come back because you didn't overstay in the first time. But if you overstay and try to come back on a work visa, it's almost impossible to do so. So um, just bear that in mind. Make sure the job that you're coming to do actually exists and is a real job. Um, I just put up a slide here about illegal working. I'm not going to go too deep into that because I want to get to some questions. But you have to bear in mind if you're an employer that um, now the, you know, uh, the Home Office have said they can imprison people for up to five years and you can get a fine, a notice, and get a fine of six up to £60,000 for um, employing people illegally. So you need to make sure that you either have the share code for your employer, if they still have their residence card in date, or that you check online on the Home Office portal um, to see whether this person is still eligible to work. And it's also very important for you as a... Um, as an, uh, a migrant, an employee, to make sure that you have the proper leave to remain and the right to work. That's very important for yourself. So, uh, MJ, I want to thank may, you may, so may much I, for joining us. May, may I? Yes, just add, to please do. Um, on behalf of um, uh, migrants, brothers and sisters, um, to say to any employer who is on the platform, uh, that the fact that someone doesn't have a share code does not mm -hmm. mean they don't have the right to work. There are instances where there would, the share code um, scheme is not applicable. For example, where someone's uh, leave uh, was about to run out and they've submitted an, uh, uh, an extension of variation application, which still allows them to remain in the country under what is called deemed leave. Uh, it is deemed that they are leave to remain and the conditions attached to that leave continue until a decision is made on that application. What then happens is that because the date on their actual biometric card would, as it were, have expired, so the card itself has a, gone past the date. It, it, the date on the card has expired. The employer immediately thinks, oh, you are here illegally. And the person says, no, I've put in an application. I've got what is called a unique application reference number, which is usually 16 digit number. You can send this through what is called the employer check-in service. And within five working days, that will be confirmed because the home office would have the record that that person has lodged another application. And the home office will be able to confirm that they are entitled to work and to remain to uh, rent, uh, as it were. So that's a message for employers. It's quite unfortunate that the Home Office has not spelled out uh, mm -hmm. these uh, two sets of um, uh, ways of finding out uh, if the uh, uh, the migrant could, could work. It's not been spelled out properly. And um, a lot of employers they just back off and say, no, we, we're sorry, we can't employ you. We'd have to terminate your employment and causes a lot of distress for migrants. Absolutely, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So it's very important, employers, don't be lazy. Look at, if, if, even if your employer doesn't, isn't able to give you the share code, um, you need to look up and check online. Um, because especially with the home office delays, um, those applications are taking an awful long time to be yeah. decided. And so, you know, it can be well past six months or a year when somebody's application hasn't been decided, where they leave their residence card, not they leave to remain, but their residence card has expired. So we encourage all employers not to be lazy or to be frightened um, and to do make that um, uh, application online. Just do just do make the check, I should say, do yeah. the check online to make sure that your employer is your employee is legally in the UK yeah. um, and you're also covered. Um, MJ, I want to go to some questions. If people have questions at all, um, you can either put them in the chat or put your hand up um, and we can take some questions. Yes, PN has a hand raised. Let me ask you to unmute. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. You can go ahead and speak, please. Oh, hello. Hi. Thank you so much for your information today and uh, having us all here and all that you provided is really helpful. I've just got a uh, one question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer. Uh, so I've been in a skilled 
work visa. And, and now I'm uh, moving on to healthcare visa because I just graduated as a nurse. But my skilled work visa was five years and they've now offered me like three years sponsorship. How does that uh, put me in terms of uh, obtaining my um, leave, indefinite leave to remain? My skilled visa was meant to be renewed again on 2027. So now I've got three years. I've only had two years in that skilled visa. I don't know if you understand my question. You should be able to add, um, you should be able to add the three years, the forthcoming three years to the two, I, I, if I had you right, you've already done two years as a skilled worker. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you can add that up with the three years with your new employers. At the end of that, you would have spent five years here as a skilled worker. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Any other question? I'm not sure if it's... Um, there's a question, who can switch to skilled worker visa? But I think you're going to be, need to be a bit more specific. So... You can always unmute if you want and um, or ask to unmute and then just ask the question because I don't see who can switch to skilled worker. It depends. So if you've got particular, unless MJ, you want to discuss that, who can switch? Uh, yes, to I, I, I'll say that anyone here would leave to remain um, in excess of six months. Uh, I think it's more of um, who is not able to switch to skilled work visa. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier on, um, uh, visitors are not allowed. Uh, those on, uh, on medical uh, visas are not allowed because they are classified as visitors. Um, Short-term students are not allowed. Students who have not completed their course of study or do not have the certificate of completion, you don't need to have received um, your degree certificate, but you must have your a certificate of completion. And it's not only graduates. Um, students who have come in to do their A-levels uh, may be able to switch, uh, depending on the type of healthcare, uh, uh, the type of skilled visa they, 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 they are applying for, uh, provided they've completed their course of study and they have a completion certificate, a completion letter, or they've received their degree certificate, they, they should be able to switch. Um, Workers in other categories uh, of skilled work can move, like uh, the person who asked us the question earlier and was saying, if you've been in, um, as a skilled worker or you want to move to another skilled area, you can always switch. Uh, so it's it's quite flexible, but you do ask of your lawyer, uh, uh, you know, seek legal advice on that. Yes, thank you. Because it can be um it can be refused or sent back as invalid um if you're not in the category to switch. Yes. So you need to just make sure that you um check before you make that application. Um okay, um there's another question here um which says so can dependents of skilled workers switch to skilled worker? Depending on their leave to remain. If uh, 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 if the dependent of a skilled worker, um, for example, was their dependent spouse, they can switch. There is nothing stopping them from switching. Uh, if the dependent was a child and does not have not has not attained the age of eighteen, and then um, they won't be able to switch. But if if the child has attained the age of eighteen and has the right qualification. Uh, they can switch, yeah. Yes, yeah. So that follows um, <laughs> through, really, in terms of um, the answer, I guess, is yes. But obviously, if it's a child, then it's not going to work anyway. Yeah. Um, do I need to make a new application or is it just a matter? OK, so the person, I don't know if we'll be able to answer this question, really, but I will see. Um, so the person who asked earlier about adding the, the whichever route to get indefinitely to remain, says, do I need to make a new application or is it just a matter of informing the Home Office? So uh, I think really we wouldn't ask you, we wouldn't advise you on that here because you may go make a new application when you're not supposed to, or you may just advise the Home Office when you're supposed to make a new application. I think that's a bit too specific. 
Um, what I would say is um, you can always contact us for a case assessment and we can go over that with you. Or if you've already got a solicitor acting for you or you normally use a solicitor, then it's best to get that specific advice from yeah. the solicitor. I don't know if MJ, you want to add anything generally on that point? Yes, uh, it's usually, uh, you know, best uh, to make sure that uh, one gets it right uh, in your peculiar situation. Uh, because uh, uh, doing the wrong thing uh, may cost you the years you've already accumulated. Mm -hmm. Just taking a wrong step. By the time you go back to the home office uh, to correct it, if you're able to correct it, uh, you probably would not be able to recoup uh, the time you've lost. Uh, so it's best to uh, you know uh, speak to your legal advisor if you have one. If not, you can contact Rachel afterwards. Yeah, get some specific specific advice because it's not even a human rights type application. So they may they could refuse you and then give, you have no other grounds to be here. Um, so you have to be mindful of that. Yeah. OK, so we're going to take if there's another question and then um, we'll take the last two questions. There's another question here. Um, can you use the same English test certificate that you used for entry clearance when applying for an extension, even though it has expired? All right. Do you want me to deal with that? Yes, you can, please. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, now we've got a special guest. <laughs> if, you, if you've used um, the same uh, qualification on your way in, it keeps that qualification live. And you can always use it for your in-country uh, applications. Um, usually, you'll be able to do that. Yes. Yes, so generally the answer is yes, but for your specific yes. case, and because your application could fail on other things as well, but yes. that's generally the answer um, is yes. And yeah, by all means, you can um, be in touch. So I think- May um, I just put yes. do a quick clarification on that? As far as skilled workers are concerned, usually yes. Uh, but in a situation where it's something like um, coming to join a spouse or a family member uh, where the 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 level of the English test on your way in was lower than one that you would need when you are seeking an extension. Then you would have to take new tests at a higher level in country before you were able to do your extension. Yes. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good point there. I mean, we're talking about skilled worker visas here, yeah. but just in case, because the person wasn't specific of to yeah. what visa they're referring to. But yeah, very good point. You may need to upgrade your English test, so to speak, if you're going down the um, spouse visa route or other type of application. So just be careful um, of the application that you're making there. Very good qualification. And then the last question that we're going to take is, can you appeal a skilled worker application? So I will ask our special guest to deal with that one as well. When you say, can you appeal, Yes, I think they mean appeal, not administrative review. So probably yes. just a distinction. Okay, well, really, um, for skilled workers, there's what is called an administrative review. That's the process in place. And if an application was refused, um, one would usually have um, the right to a, a, a administrative review, request for administrative review. Uh, it's not as... Uh, as uh, embraced by migrants as um, an appeal where you have independent appellate authority and someone different looking at your case. It goes back to the home office. Uh, so administrative reviews uh, uh, is not something we really look forward to, uh, unless, of course, they, there's been an error of law, obvious error of law on the side of the home office. Um, uh, so yes, you can have an administrative review, but that's not the same as having an appeal. Yes, yeah, I mean, I've got one rummaging around going back to the Home Office and they accepted that they made a mistake on the application, so they -de they're deciding it again. But it's not, it's, not as, um, it's not as friendly to do, I guess, as an appeal, because an appeal goes to an immigration judge, um, although it can take longer. But with the Home Office delays, they're both taking quite a while. But when you've got something that's not strictly... Um, human rights application so like a skilled worker visa doesn't really involve human rights yes. um, indefinitely Tremaine doesn't really involve human rights then it's highly likely that you're not going to get the right of appeal 
you're just going to get a normal did the government body get it wrong type um, thing in a way you ask them to make an administrative review of their own decision making process so um yeah so you can't appeal a skilled worker application i guess is what we're saying but you have an administrative review which is another way of the home office um looking at it again yes. so yeah thank you and um, mj for that answer yes and, and of so, course if yes. the administrative review mm. turns out to be negative um uh, in theory uh, one could uh, take it further and go for what we call judicial review where you mm -hmm. go to the courts very expensive process and um, it's one that is decided uh, on discretion on the discretion of the court so uh, the ch chances of success in judicial review uh, are usually uh, slimmer than with appeals and um, so we've also had situations where we've overturned a case by a uh, true administrative review um, the home office says, well, we got it wrong on this point, so we consider it again, and they still refuse on another point. Mm -hmm. Yes. That can be very, very frustrating for migrants. Uh, so be bear that in mind. That's why it's, it's very, very important uh, to seek legal advice before you put in your application. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and if it's not that strong, really think about all the costs involved as well. Yeah. So um, I won't take any more questions. Um, this is this is being recorded. It is being recorded, so I think it will go up on our um, YouTube channel. Um, and so, yes, the slides will be available um, as part of that. And then the Q and A will be like a um, a podcast type looking thing. So wonderful. So we've had a wonderful evening, MJ, Mr. Jibu. I would love to thank you so much for very welcome um, joining us today on talking about the skilled visa route. Um, I hope you'll be a regular. I look forward to being a regular guest. No problem and at all. Thank you. And we've had such a good evening and it's been so informative um, and so much information. So don't forget, if you want to uh, talk more specifically about your case and you need to do that via a case assessment, um, I call it a discussion now, you can contact us at clarityvisas.com, put a little bit of your information in the um, form. And then if, I, if it's something we can help you with, I'll give you a call back and I'll let you know. Um, if it's something that we need more information about, then we'll offer you a case, um, a consultation, a full consultation. If it's something that really is not going anywhere, then I can just call you back and just let you know that it's not, you know, it's not going anywhere. Um, because we like to take cases which have a chance of success. Yes, we do challenge the Home Office, but we challenge them where we think we're right. We don't challenge them where, you know, we know that they're, they're probably, we challenge them where we think they're wrong. We don't challenge them where we think they're probably right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because that just wastes a lot of money and a lot of time and causes distress. So I'd like to thank everybody for um, their time today and um, do stay in touch. Subscribe to our newsletter at clarityvisas.com. Have a great evening, everybody. Um, take care. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.